ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مهتد ومن يهدي فلا مهتد ومن يهدي فلا مهتد وبعد I start off by saying salam to all of my brothers and sisters assembled in this beautiful place and I ask God to forgive us our trespasses, our mistakes and the evil that may lurk within all of us. It was just last week that my counterpart in Linwood Mosque, Christchurch, New Zealand, wearing silver robes to what I'm wearing and speaking right about the same time that I was speaking, when that event took place. And before it was over, he lived. But not before his robes were completely bloodstained. To me, that's a mark of honor. That he remained, he defended, he didn't run away. And he is partially credited along with another member of that congregation for preventing a greater loss of life in the second mosque at the Gunnar Bridge, the Lindley Mosque. The first one was Thor Mosque. So, I guess it's part of my job as a university chaplain to offer thoughts and prayers. And of course, that's very important. But I think it's very important also, and we have a prophetic tradition that goes back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that says, help your brother whether he is an oppressor or he is the oppressed. People around the Prophet at the time were dumbfounded by what he said. Because they said, well, you know how to help someone who's oppressed. This makes sense. How do you help an oppressor? He said, stop him from oppressing. Put a stop to his oppression. An interesting thing to me is that he's still a brother. I pray for the salvation of that person. Zealand from Australia who did that. And I pray for the salvation of the person who killed innocent lives in the tree of life of some God, and the one who did Sherwood sure Oaks, and the one who did Oklahoma City bombing, and those who did the World Trade Center bombing, and those who did 9-11. Well, this goes on. Us assembled here today in a church, originally dedicated to Christ. And that attack in Christ's church had nothing to do with Christ, and nothing to do with the church. Even though the gunman terrorist may have used some Christian motifs in his manifesto. And so for me, the real measure of a person is your moral fortitude, your moral leadership, your ability to maintain your principles and your ethics even under duress. There is no suspension of morality when times call for it, because we're only defined by what we do under duress. Every man, every woman, it's easy to do things when you're not under duress. It's easy to be kind to the people you like. It's easy to praise the ones you get along with. It's easy to not get angry with those people who make you feel good about yourself. But that's not really the measure of humanity. Because everyone can do that. I think a true measure of humanity, how do you react, how do you deal with those that you don't like, that you don't know, that you don't know anything about? It may surprise you to know that Islam in the United States is older than the founding of the United States. My brothers and sisters first came to these shores probably in the mid-16th century. But they came in chains, and they were forcibly removed from their communities in Senegal, Gambia, 
Molly, and Donna. Back then, they weren't known by those names. They were known as the Mendinkins, the Wolves, the Fulanis. But they came. I was in Gambia recently, a few months ago, and it was related to me that one of those who came, there's a river that runs straight through Gambia, and it's very convenient because it leads right out to the Atlantic Ocean. So the slave trade came through that river, and then there was a staging point on an island called Punta Quinte Island, where they would move on to the North American shores. And this person managed to escape, and he ran back to his community. But he was a learned man, he was a scholar, he was an imam. His father said, what are you doing back here? He said, I escaped, what do you want me to do? He said, go back. Who's going to teach those people when they get over there? Who's going to be with them? Who's going to console them? Who's going to be their leader? Who's going to heal them? So God makes martyrs out of people. But then the question becomes, what about the ones left behind? What is it that we are supposed to do? What moral lessons can we draw from that? And I think I'm going to be a little honest with you. We know that what happened in New Zealand, or what happened in Pittsburgh, or anywhere else, it's all related. We know it's not a New Zealand issue. We know it's not an Australia issue. We know that that man wrote the names of other mass murderers on his weapons as he walked in. We know that he mentioned other names in his manifesto, even some of the political leadership in this country. So we can't say that it's unrelated. And I have to be honest with you as well, and I really relate this to my chaplain, Professor Stephen. If you read some of the comments on the articles dealing with the New Zealand tragedy, You'll find people living, not just in the United States, not just in Bethlehem, but people on this campus even, who support what happened. Or at the very least, are not distressed about it. So we have this amongst us. We don't have to look too far. We don't have to think about how to reform people in New Zealand. Because I think, honestly, as was mentioned earlier, the people in New Zealand got it right. And they understand what moral and principled leadership is, and I applaud and commend Prime Minister Arden of New Zealand for her principal leadership in this time of crisis. And I recall one of Aesop's fables about the red bull, the white bull, and the black bull, who were able to fend off the lion because they stuck together. So the lion became a little bit sneaky, a little bit sly in his approach. He knew that he couldn't take all three of them at once. So he goes to the red bull and said, you know, if you just let me eat the white bull, then I'll leave you guys alone. You got nothing to worry about. Just give me him and then we'll be okay. So he thought, I said, okay, at least I'll be safe after that. So the lion went and ate the white bull. Then the lion goes back to the red bull again. He said, you know, you'll be safe, just let me eat the black bull. I said, okay. Then the lion ate the black bull. Then he comes around to the white bull before the lion can say anything. He said, I was eating, or the, the red bull, I was eating the day the white bull was eaten. The day I let him be eaten by you, I was myself eaten already. So if we allow, hatred, we allow fear of the other, we allow our own shortcomings and anxieties to overcome us to the degree where we hurt others, then it's, it's an attack on all of us. It's not just one of us. We are facing crises, and not just in the United States, but the same community. Suicide rates have never been as high in Lehigh County as they are now. Opioid addiction has never been as high as it's been right now. People's feeling of alienation and isolation and feeling like nobody cares about them, I think, are also historic highs. So I'm not going to talk about gun legislation and whether assault weapons should be banned or controlled or any of that thing, that type of thing. That's for our politicians in Washington to rank about.
about in those state capitals. But what can we do? What do we have at our disposal that we can do? And I'll begin by saying about myself, I love every single person in this world. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. My God, I love every single person in this world. You honor us with your presence. You honor us with your concern. You honor us with your gentleness. And I wish that we could all feel that way about each other. I wish we could live in a world where even when we have differences, when we have disagreements, we learn how to speak to one another and overcome those differences. And not let those differences and disagreements allow us to demonize, and as was said earlier, otherize other people. I mean, isn't that what a university education is about? Isn't that what we're here? Isn't that what we come here to learn? How to get along with people of diverse backgrounds and beliefs and ethnicities and languages? Isn't that the idea altogether? So why don't we come together and resolve as a community to do that for one another? And one of the traditions also of our prophet is begin with yourself and then those around you. We can't change all of society at once. But I can certainly change what I do within myself, within my small community, within my family, within my small group of friends. I certainly can do that. So, these are some of my reflections. I'm going to conclude the first part of the sermon, and I'll get right into the second part of the prayer. Seek forgiveness from God, because the one who does so is like without sin. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد. So I'd like to conclude by thanking the university, thanking President Simon, Provost Farrell, University Chaplain Lloyd Stephan, and Rabbi Steve Nathan, and also Donald Dowdy, the head of our STEM, for supporting our efforts and supporting this effort and really trying to bring about some positive change. And I think positive change may begin with things that are administrative in nature, but they can't end there. We can appoint to all of the diversity and inclusion staff and personnel that we want, but at the end of the day, it's not going to change our culture by itself. That takes resolve from me and from you and from all of us here. So unfortunately, I don't think this is the last time we're going to do something like this. But maybe, just maybe, we have the resolve, it's the last time we have to issue for a call like this. And maybe it's beginning tonight, or tomorrow, or the day after, we can introduce positive changes in our own lives and in other people's lives. And I have just one piece of advice to end up with. Let's all resolve that when we leave, we can go out the doors of this magnificent church where Jewish services are done, where Catholic services are done, where Protestant services are done, and Muslim services are done, that we pledge with one another that any human being we come across, we pledge to have a positive interaction with them. That we don't want to come across another human being and we leave them in a worse state than when they started with us. And that can be accomplished with a simple thing like a smile. You go back to your offices, go back to where you work, walk in with a smile, especially if you're a leader. It'll change the whole atmosphere in the office that you work in. And let us resolve to come over our differences and learn more about one another. As I said earlier, Muslims have been in this country since the 15th century, the 16th century, and we're not going anywhere. I am not going to stop going to Friday services. I'm not going to stop doing them, even if it means my life. Because that's what we are, that's what defines us. <clears throat> and I think there are some things in life that are worth sacrificing for. And I think sacrificing for what's right, what's moral, what's principled, what's ethical, is one of those things. Thank you. I'm going to close off with a small prayer, and we'll begin with the ritual prayer here on the side for those who would like to join us, they can do so. I ask God to reflect upon us and shine His light upon us and to lift the burden upon all our brothers and sisters where they may be. I ask them to offer solace to all the victims of all those tragedies wherever they may be, whether they be in this country, whether they be in New Zealand, whether they be in Europe, or in Africa, or in Afghanistan, or in Palestine.
Palestine or anywhere that they may reside. I ask God to lift all those trials and tribulations. I ask God to make this a community of loving brothers and sisters, that we love each other, that we seek harmony between one another, that we learn to overlook each one of our missteps and our mistakes, and to bring us to an understanding of one another so that even before we may get to the paradise in heaven, that we create some sort of livable paradise here on earth. Amen. Welcome to Salaam.